Welcome to Spine Academy. In this video, we're going to review bony degeneration of the cervical spine. This video is an excerpt from a broader course on cervical spondylosis, which is age-related degeneration of the cervical spine. If you're interested in learning more and seeing the full course, we've left a link in the description. Next, we're going to talk about cervical bony degeneration, or osseous degeneration, some people would call it. This is classic arthritis, because arthritis generally implies degeneration of bones and joints. And it's not really fair to call arthritis of the cervical spine arthritis, because as we talked about, ligaments and discs can be affected, but the bony parts can be affected as well. So think of this as really arthritis of the cervical spine. Now, when you look at the cervical spine from the side, you can see that there are a number of places where bones come together, and arthritis generally affects joints. So if you look at these structures in the back here, these are what's called, again, the facet joints. So you can see part of C3 kind of articulating with C4, which means kind of rubbing against. That's the joint where those two bones kind of move relative to each other. Uh, and you can see the facet joint will articulate with the bone above and with the bone below. You can see here how the bones themselves, these are some of the facet joints in the back, but there's a couple places where the j bones can get pretty close together, way out on the edges of these smiley faces here, what's called the uncovertebral joints. That's another place where you frequently will see some degree of arthritis. Now, when you look at a, a pick, like a real world kind of example, like we've used a couple of today, you can kind of see this is the bone. This is everything else has been removed. The discs are removed, the ligaments are removed, the spinal cord and nerves, of course, are removed. This is just looking at what the bones in somebody with arthritis might look like. And you can see here how there's some bone spurs in different places, right? You see these little lips over here, and there's some bone spurs up front here. You can see there's not much cushion between these bones, and that's part of the reason there's a bit of a reaction here. You can see up here where there was good cushion here, there's not a lot of reactive changes. But if you just look at bone spurs themselves, you can see that they can affect different parts of the spine. They will affect the joints back here, the facet joints. We call that facet hypertrophy. We'll get into that in a little more detail. They can affect the edges of the end plates or the vertebral bodies themselves, what we call end plates themselves. You can start getting bone spurs off the front and some like, like there are over here and sometimes off the back, which you can't see in this picture over there. But bone spurs happen when people have have bones that kind of rub together. So an osteophyte, which is the clinical or the medical term for bone spur, osteophytes are bone spur spurs that form as a reaction to stress. They usually involve bony joints or surfaces where bones come together. So the facet joints back here, or these end plates that don't have sufficient cushion between them, or the uncovertebral joints that we'll talk about in just a second. But the medical term for that is osteophytes. So if you see that term in one of your um, reports or something like that, that's what that really means. Now, if you look at the same picture that we had looked at before, we talked about the disc herniation here, but this picture also shows bone material over here. This is a bone spur which is pressing on the nerve right here. Now that structure is called the uncovertebral joint, and we will talk about that in a little bit because it's important to kind of understand where that is in space. You can even see there's a little bit of bony overgrowth here, and together these things are squeezing on the nerve right there. That nerve is, of course, that little structure that's running right out the center over there. But in this case, this side kind of shows what bone spurs can do to the structures that are around them. Now, when you look at an illustration of it, you can kind of see the same type of thing. There's some bone spur material that's in front of the nerve here. And by comparison, like if you look at the other side, this is wide open there. That bone spur material is involving the uncovertebral joints, which we'll talk again in a minute. And here you can see there's some bone spurs affecting the joint in the back. And again, those, that irregularity can end up causing narrowing of different structures. Classically, it will cause narrowing of the foramen. Like you look, this is a nice healthy foramen out here. This, is, this foramen right there, you can see is really tight because of the bone spurs that are around it. Now, when you look at a picture like this, you can kind of see that there's some irregularity, but you don't get a really clear sense of what the anatomy is like. You can see that there's some arthritis involving the joints here. As I said, that is called facet hypertrophy. So it is bone spur formation that involves these facet joints there. We call that facet hypertrophy. The other thing I mentioned we were going to talk about is uncovertebral hypertrophy. So the facet hypertrophy is back here because the joints are in the back part of the spine. 
the uncovertebral hypertrophy is part of a joint or a pseudo joint that's in the front part of the spine. So this is a slice that we don't look at a lot. This is called a coronal slice right down the center. So somebody's head would be up here and their feet would be kind of down towards the floor here. And you can see this is looking at the spine right like this. So you can see the discs at these different levels here. And the disc is not a flat pancake. It actually kind of looks a little bit like a smiley face here. So you can kind of see the center of the disc is where there is, like uh, the center of the, of the disc space is where most of the disc is. And then there's these edges right here. And that little process that comes up is called the uncinate process. So this joint or pseudo joint is called the uncovertebral joint. And it's where these two bones can kind of be close together. The reason it is called a pseudo joint and not a real joint is because there is no capsule around that. Most joints have to have a, uh, a joint capsule. There is no capsule around that structure. But again, the bones come close together. And as they come close together, they can kind of rub against each other. And you can form these bone spurs in that location, which we call uncovertebral hypertrophy. So uncovertebral hypertrophy is bone spur formation involving this joint here, or kind of like if you look on this picture, this joint right there with these little black arrows right there, that is uncovertebral hypertrophy. So the two principal places that you get bony arthritis in the cervical spine that matter are really here, the facet hypertrophy and the uncovertebral hypertrophy. So again, you can kind of see this is the facet hypertrophy. You can't really see the uncovertebral hypertrophy on this. So we're instead gonna take a slice like this again. This is that oblique view that we're gonna look at. And again, this allows us to look kind of straight down into the frame Foramen. And when you look at this, here you can kind of see up high, it looks great. The foramen looks nice, the nerves look good. As you get down lower, you can see here's some disc material, like a herniation that's pressing on the nerve right there. And then these two levels, the five, six, and six, seven levels, you can see these bone spurs start kind of encroaching on the nerve from the front. And here you can see these bone spurs that involve the joint kind of encroaching on the nerve from the back. And together, that uncovertebral hypertrophy in the front and the facet hypertrophy in the back will cause narrowing of that space, which is called the neural foramen, where the nerve can be under pressure. So important concepts to take away from bony degeneration when we think about spondylosis is that this is kind of traditional arthritis. It is involving joints and pseudo joints where bones kind of rub together. The bone spurs principally affect the facet joints, as we said, these things in the back. They can affect the end plates. The end plate is the surface of the vertebral body. That's where the disc itself sits. That is called the end plate. Think of it as the top of a tuna can. So it'll affect the end plates, like you can see over here, and it'll affect the uncovertebral joints, like you can see over here. Those are the typical places that you will see arthritis in the spine from C2 down. Higher up, there can be different types of arthritis because again, it looks a little different at the top of the neck. Also, just like disc degeneration, these structures do not disappear over time. They typically do not resorb. Now, sometimes when people have surgery and a level is fused, these will kind of remodel over time and disappear. But in the absence of that, most of the time, these bone spurs will stay. They're kind of one-way things, again, that slowly kind of get worse and worse and worse. People develop these bone spurs and they typically do not resorb or disappear on their own. And then lastly, they can typically be different at every level, just like the degeneration, like five, six is worse than three, four, or four, five. Uh, five, six, and six, seven are worse in this picture. Every level will be a little bit different. Some levels may have more bony arthritis or bone spurs, and some levels may have less. And in fact, one side may have more than the other at the same level. At C5-6, the right side can have a lot more and the left side may have a lot less, like on that axial slice that I had shown before. So bony arthritis is a really important consideration when we're thinking about symptoms. It typically will cause pressure on nerves more than the spinal cord, although some bone spurs can cause pressure on the spinal cord as well. And when we think about how to evaluate that, we typically will get a CAT scan to really understand the bone spurs, the relationship to the discs, and ligaments and the nerves and the spinal cord. All of that kind of is part of the consideration, figuring out how to manage someone's cervical spondylosis. Thank you for watching this video. I hope you found it informative. If you've enjoyed it, please like and subscribe. If you have any questions, comments, or ideas for future content, we'd welcome them in the comment section below.